Welcome back, everybody. You're listening to Cut the Shit, a podcast series that aims to take a closer look at the impact of the IT industry, both the good and the bad. Cut the Shit is brought to you by Plow Networks, a managed IT services company based just outside Nashville, Tennessee. I'm Brian Link, EVP of Products and Services here at Plow, and I'll be your host for this series. I'll ask questions, and with the help of our guests, try to dig deep on some of the key challenges we all face dealing with IT. So with that, let's cut the shit and get started. On today's episode, I am pleased to have an old friend and colleague join the podcast to talk about something completely different. My guest is Carlos Camacho, head of product and growth for Riskout, an early stage financial technology company based in Austin, Texas. After initially starting his career in tech recruiting, Carlos moved into the fintech space about 10 years ago, and since then has worked in a variety of product roles focused around data analytics, rewards, and marketing systems. His work at Riskout is fascinating and may even seem a bit controversial to some of you, but we dig in on what they are doing to help banks effectively serve high-risk businesses like money services companies and cannabis producers, because it seems to have direct parallels for others in more traditional highly regulated industries like healthcare. We cover a lot of ground on this one. So without further ado, my conversation with Carlos Camacho. Enjoy. Carlos, welcome to Cut the Shit. How you doing today? Hey, Brian. I'm doing great. What's going on in Austin, Texas? Uh, well, we've already started summer, so I'm sweating currently. Uh, and I'll keep doing that through mid-October. I, I thought maybe you were going to say till Christmas, but I wasn't sure. <laughs> I'm no, it actually sure. it'll it'll cool off in October. Now, w- remind me, did you grow up in Houston? I did, so I'm used to swampy weather. I was going to uh, say, grew up so mostly this is, in Houston. You're used to it being hot, right? I spent some time out in uh, Virginia and DC, um, and then uh, I moved back to Austin to start a business in 2012. 2012. Ten years. Been here a decade now. Yeah, it's crazy. Um. I know where you are today, so a lot of times I ask people where they are, but I know what city you're in, and I also know your location because, as I said in the intro, uh, we worked we worked together for a while, um, and but we were always working together in a remote environment. So I've seen your background before, um, so I know I know where you are. Um, what you know, one of the things I like to ask people, and it's just I think it kind of helps at least give us a, some sort of sense of of your background in technology, right? Because while Oftentimes we talk to people who are in what I'd call sort of the traditional IT industry. You are obviously not. You're in the software or sort of product development fintech world. So we'll get to that. But take a step back for me. And, and as you think about kind of the past couple of years when you were already working remote, what's one of the most interesting uses of technology or a hack or anything that you've seen somebody come up with to deal with the situation we've had in the past couple of years, primarily around remote work? Um, setting consistency, right? Particularly right now, we're in that weird transition phase back into the office, right? Employees are resisting it, but, um, setting, setting consistent, like Mondays and Fridays, you know, we don't care where you work from, but Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we're going to pack all the meetings in there. You want to come in. If you don't want to come in, that's kind of your choice, but having some sort of regularity of schedule, particularly when you're at a really tiny company like we are, um, has been helpful. So knowing that when I go into the office, I'm going to get the full office experience. I'm going to get to see the people I want to talk to. I get those water cooler conversations, the pass you in the hallway kind of conversations, because otherwise you show up to the office and you're the only one there. And there's no point in being in the office. You could just easily Uh, be at home right, or somewhere else. Yeah. For me, though, but I think a, a lot of folks um, have their kids at home. It's not a good work environment for them. I'm very lucky that uh, I've got this extra room that I can work out of. Uh, but a lot of people don't have that. And so they're desperate to get back into the office uh, to get some peace and quiet. Right. And so right. just coordinating all of the different needs now, um, I think, helps a lot for getting both the benefit of work from home and the benefit of coming into the office. Are the bulk of the folks uh, at Risk Out in the Austin area? Like, could you come to the, could everybody be at the office every day if you wanted to be? Yeah, but it comes down to, uh, you know, if we're on a bunch of calls, for example, 
Now we need more conference rooms because we've got, you know, an open office space. So it's actually, if you're spending all day on calls, it's better to be at your house. Sure. Yeah, no, no. I was just curious if it was, if how distributed you were, because in our case, it was a pretty much a, a true traditional localized business, meaning that everybody that worked there also lived in the area. But since really in the past couple of years, we've added some people, including me, who don't actually live in Nashville, Tennessee. I live in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and I go to Nashville once a month. And to, to your point, try to get the full office experience while I'm there. But most of the time, I'm very often on a call with three people who live in Nashville who are also at home, who aren't in the office either. So the fact that I'm not in Nashville doesn't really make any difference in that case. So it's we sort of scrambled the eggs, if you will, on the geographic location of everybody. I was just curious about where everyone was for risk out. Less than half are in Austin. Okay. And so it allows us. So you're distributed anyway. Yeah. Yeah. We're distributed anyway. And particularly for a startup, it lets us save a lot of money on, on office space. We've got a space yeah. where we can all come together, at least the folks here in Austin, um, when we need to. But we don't have to, as we grow, we won't have to move into bigger office spaces as yeah. soon. It's going to be interesting to see, I mean, the, what you just described is sort of the Monday and Friday bookend with, uh, you know, with days in the middle, maybe more office oriented or meeting oriented. I think operationally, um, at, at least for the businesses that don't require face-to-face -face service to, you know, to deliver your product, which isn't as big a percentage as I thought it was. I was listening to something today and it, it turns out about 30 to 35% of the workforce was actually able to work from home during COVID. I thought it was much bigger than that. Right? Yeah, me too. So, but that's because we live in a world where most of the people we know were able to work from home, right? I mean, it's kind of like, I mean, you know, most people don't realize that, you know, less than 40% of Americans have a college degree. Right? It's about 38, 39%. It seems like a lot more to me, but that's because most of the I think they would have taught that in college. Uh, you, know? you, you would think. Well, maybe that's maybe that's part of the issue. Maybe maybe we're the ones that went the wrong direction. But anyway, we're going down a rabbit hole. We can we can we can pull out of that. Um, it is going to be interesting to see how that goes um, in terms of the delivery of services and what it means for office life in in kind of the post pandemic. What what Microsoft calls the modern workplace or remote work or whatever you want to call it, right? Um, I felt lucky to be on the front end of that like you, where I was already remote prior to COVID. So I didn't have that jarring transition that a lot of people did, but I felt like things got easier when everybody was sort of in that same boat because, uh, you know, like me making the comment, you're, you know, where you sit today and where I sit today are in our house. There's no, I don't feel any pressure to pretend like I'm in the office to try to fool somebody. Whereas once upon a time, that would have been the case, right? You wouldn't want someone to know you were at home. I, I, that stigma, I think, is pretty much completely gone. I remember um, uh, when my friends and I started working in the kind of mid two thousands. We uh, someone bought a mouse pad that would actually like move underneath the mouse to keep that mouse moving. He, they were in consulting, and the whole goal was to just keep that computer active because there's all that tracking software in your computer that let your bosses know they must not be doing anything. Then. Yeah, they must not be doing anything. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Why are you able to go out for uh, drinks at four o'clock? Like. I got it covered. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. All right. Well, let's jump into it. Um, you've got an interesting background um, and, and a current, you know, an interesting situation where you are today. But before we sort of get to that, why don't you give us a little thumbnail sketch, kind of, again, hit the highlights for your career and kind of to where you are today so that the, uh, you know, so that the audience knows kind of what you're all about. Yeah. Let's assume that there are highlights here to hit. But uh, I, I started out in recruiting, actually. And uh, that was in D.C. for a few years. I went to business school to kind of change directions because I was sick of recruiting people to the jobs that I wanted. I wanted those jobs. Um, so I got in, uh, got involved in technology, started a company right out of school, um, which brought me here to, to Austin. And I didn't really realize it at the time, but effectively the business I was starting was a data business, right? gathering information, information that has value. Um, and then monetizing that data. And that's been kind of a theme of my career uh, as I've continued to work for other startups. You and I worked together at, uh, at NCR. I worked here uh, for a company in Austin called Q2. Both of those were in the community banking space. And that was really five years uh, of a deep learning experience about really complicated 
industry, community banking, uh, and, and the technology services provided these financial institutions, you know, very unique to the US, um, super complicated network of systems, um, but a huge opportunity. And so I've stayed in the community banking space because I see such a huge opportunity to improve um, all of the processes and um, that these that these businesses uh, have in place. And so I kind of wandered into community banking, but I've stayed on purpose uh, now for uh, for quite a few years. And what drew me to Risk Scout is this huge wave that's happening around uh, what we call emerging markets. Um, this includes cannabis, so hemp and THC. This includes crypto and uh, a variety of other businesses that have evolved that for one reason or another are considered by the uh, by banks and credit unions to be higher risk. Um, and higher risk is really a, an all-encompassing category that includes clearly higher risk because you're touching a lot of cash and there's opportunity for money laundering. Also grouped into higher risk are markets that these institutions don't really understand, like crypto. At its core, crypto is either a money service business or it's not. And it's really not all that complicated from a regulatory standpoint, but from right. a technology standpoint, it's super confusing. So that gets kind of lumped in with higher risk. Um, and higher risk also includes regulatory risk, which is where hemp and cannabis uh, kind of come in. And so what's interesting about what we're doing for, for me from a technology standpoint is that I get to be part of this big technology wave that's coming, that's changing. And helping the existing platforms, the existing systems, the existing providers to be part of that growth wave. So, so help me or help us understand a little bit, kind of give us the, the quick pitch for risk out in terms of what, what are you guys offering? It sounds like you're working for banks and credit unions. I know you are, but you also are connecting directly or at least related to these higher risk businesses. Talk a little bit about what risk out when it got started and what problem are you trying to solve today? And then maybe what that, how that translates into sort of a larger opportunity over time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, our founder actually started the business um, when um, his father, who's a farmer, um, talked to his financial institution about potentially growing hemp. Now hemp was uh, legalized in 2018. It actually was, um, put into a state of prohibition along with THC marijuana in like 1937. Do us a favor. Cause I, I'm, I don't know that much about it. What's the difference between hemp and THC? Yeah. So, so the hemp plant is a, an industrial crop, it's very strong fibers, uh, good for cattle feed. Uh, the hemp seeds are high in, you know, uh, all kinds of healthy fats. The flower of the hemp. Cheech and Chong are not interested in hemp, though. Cheech and Chong are not interested in hemp. Okay, just making sure. Like a nice soft hemp T-shirt. Other than a shirt, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, the flower of the hemp plant is what we think about as cannabis or THC. Okay, thanks. And uh, but hemp, but hemp itself was illegal because you could grow the flowers. Is that why? That that's right. Um, due to a lack of understanding back in the '30s, they grouped them together, and so America lost this really awesome industrial crop because it got grouped in with the psychoactive flower that can grow on the okay. plant. Now, the THC that can be in the flower that can be very very low or very very high, depending on how you grow the crop, how you stress the crop, things like that. So, when we talk about hemp, industrial hemp. This is very low THC. So you can't get high off of any part of this plant. Gotcha. When we talk about THC, cannabis, or marijuana. That's more of what people know, right? Okay. It is grown so, specifically for the flower. Got it. So the owner's dad was a farmer, wanted to grow hemp, went to his financial institution. This was post-legalization. And they said- Post-legalization, no. they said, we'll kick you out. So he started by trying to connect financial uh, financial institutions with businesses, right? Who are the financial institutions willing to bank hemp farmers? And he started learning about THC and hemp and all of the problems. Playing a little bit of matchmaker, I guess, to a certain degree. That's right. And what he realized is that there's not enough 
financial institutions willing to play in the space to meet the demand. So we started asking why. And the reason is pretty simple. It's compliance burden. And that advanced compliance burden for these businesses makes them unprofitable to bank. So what we set out to build is a set of software that helps facilitate all of the information gathering, information validation, to make sure that you understand the pedigree of the business that you're dealing with so that a financial institution feels more comfortable banking them. Got it. And that's where the opportunity expanded. So it started with a specific problem within a specific high risk area, right? Uh, but but the broader opportunity expands beyond that. You mentioned a couple of other industries. So talk a little bit about what that looks like in terms of evolution. Yeah. So we think about uh, ga- the gaming industry, um, ATM, private ATM businesses. There's a wide variety of these types of high risk businesses that um, that require a bunch of paperwork to understand who the business is and monitor their banking activity, mostly for anti-money laundering purposes. And so all of these businesses can be a real burden on a financial institution, so they tend to wanna stay away from them. It's way easier to bank a grocery store than it is to bank a liquor store, gun store, uh, you know, hemp, uh, hemp or CBD shop. And so what we do is we help facilitate all of the information gathering Um, and the compliance uh, back and forth that goes on in the normal course of banking these businesses. Got it. So by automating that, making it easier for a bank to then approach those customers, right, to make them more profitable opportunities, expand the network of lenders who would lend to those businesses. Because I'm assuming a lot of them today, like you and I were talking about earlier, are either equity funded or just under <laughs> undercapitalized, right? Where they, they can't grow. That's um, right. And, and you know, I, I'm a novice to this industry, but what has been really mind blowing to me is that none of the big players in any part of uh, the infrastructure of a business. So capital financing, you can't get a loan if you're opening a, a THC store and oftentimes hemp. Um, growers can't get hemp or seeds or, you know, they have to use uh, venture capital financing or some other source of financing uh, to even start growing, right? All the way through the value chain, there's no Wells Fargo, there's no AIG for insurance, there's no Square for payments. Like these, the big names, Visa and MasterCard won't let you process um, debit or credit transactions. All of the big players are not in this space because at the federal level, um, THC cannabis is still illegal, right? So it's illegal to grow, sell, or possess. But on a state-by-state basis, um, over 30 states now have legalized cannabis growing and distribution in some way, shape, or form, right? Right. Um, So that puts financial institutions and businesses uh, who might serve cannabis or hemp stores in a very weird spot, right? Right. So the big guys, too risky to move in there. And it has created this incredible opportunity, right? With no Goliaths, the Davids are having a field day. Incredible opportunity for payments providers, for insurers, for uh, small to mid-sized financial institutions to come into this space and provide services without competition from from the really big players right so that's a good kind of jumping off point because um as much as i would love to get into the political discussion around whether these are good ideas the way the regulatory structure is set up we'll save that for another day um it feels like a variation on a theme when i think about uh the some of our customers we don't have any customers in your space um, you know, or in the, in, the, in the client space that your financial institutions are serving, but we have a lot of clients that are in regulated industries, particularly healthcare. Um, and while obviously it's not the same, it's also not that different in the sense that they struggle to deal with the regulatory burdens of being able to operate, right? And it, it, again, the, the example you're giving with, you know, with the CBD shop not being able to access the financial institution is a particularly problematic and acute situation. But it's not that different to say that as a, as a healthcare company, if you don't do certain things, if you don't, if you don't have certain policies and procedures in place and don't file paperwork of, 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 of lots of volume and, and 
lots of specificity, you can't keep operating, right? That's a, I mean, it doesn't mean that it, it doesn't mean that the government shouldn't be doing that to some degree, but it definitely increases the cost and the complexity of operating a company like that. No different, frankly, than really any company that serves a bank or a credit union, right? Just because you're not a bank doesn't mean you don't downstream get caught in many of those same uh, those same situations. So I'm curious from a, from Riskout's perspective, what's it been like for you guys in terms of trying to meet requirements of the banks that you actually work with? Because I, assum- I my assumption is just knowing from my own experience, they are asking you to de- pro- to provide information because they have to provide it upstream to the regulators. That, that's right. Um, I'll say this about regulation. Um, if you're going to have it, make it consistent and uh, and and try and have it uh, be unchanged. Right. The challenge right now is there are regulations in place, both at the federal and state level, but they're on shaky sand right now. Right. Their they're, they're foundation uh, is constantly shifting. So it's very difficult to keep up with the changes in those regulations. Um, take a uh, financial institution that's trying to bank uh, a multi-state operator, right? So this would be a cannabis business that operates in multiple states. This financial institution now has to become a regulatory expert about all of the state law and the federal law, right? And they need to make sure that each of the businesses in each of those different regulatory environments are following the local rules as well as the federal rules, right? right? So now they have have to become, uh, they have to build out an entire team uh, to do this. Um, and that's, that's rough. Now you have, um, you know, folks like, <laughs> I, I sent you this article about how North Carolina is poised to um, effectively make hemp illegal this summer if by letting uh, a portion of a law um, just kind of expire. Right. And so when you're trying to build a business in an, in an environment like that, where with one fell swoop, the state Congress can wipe out your entire industry, it's kind of scary, right? And you start to understand why the big players aren't in the space. Right. But you're absolutely right. Your, your earlier point that um, fintechs, startups, uh, really forward-thinking financial institutions, they've, they, they dove into this, right? And the ones that are successful have to be nimble. They have to be able to go, okay, actually that vendor's going away. The laws changed a little bit. The, the tides are changing. Oh, this is, this is allowed. This is not allowed. This is a gray area. Um, you have to be able to, uh, to pivot and move and, and be nimble. The other thing is you're right there inheriting uh, regulation from somewhere else, right? Visa and MasterCard won't process transactions for um, debit and credit, right? Let's start there. What are the downstream effects? Well, now if you have a THC store, you can't accept credit cards. The pros and cons of regulation is they're a constraint and the real innovators are the ones who can find ways to navigate those constraints. Um, you see this everywhere. You see this in the healthcare industry. Sure. Um, you see this uh, where people have been able to innovate because to get or not get around the regulations, but to profitably adhere to the regulations. I mean, it's an opportunity. I mean, it, whatever whatever you want to just however you want to describe it. I mean, that's somewhat you know value free judgment, but that's basically what it is, right? right that's right. So, for example, in uh, in a lot of states, um, you'll go to a, a a THC store, you'll buy your product, and you swipe a debit card. What's actually happening is they'll run it through an ATM. You run an ATM transaction and say you're purchasing $35 a product. You run an ATM transaction, you pull out 40 bucks and the cashier hands you your change and puts the rest in the till. So effectively for the end user, you're doing a debit transaction, but you're actually operating in cash, right? right? Innovation. Visa's trying to squash that, but um, you know, that that's, just a, a key example of this gray area where a lot of these businesses have to operate. Um, but there's also a lot of interesting uh, payments innovation going on with a, you know, uh, I see a lot of Starbucks style 
uh, prepaid card type of uh, applications, right? Where you look, transfer money from your bank account to this loaded card or app and then make purchases there. And, and in that localized environment, that's legal, you're good, right. um, that works there. So those kinds of things where um, everyone on the value chain, even the um, even the fintechs and the folks who are willing to take on a little bit more risk, ultimately they have to play by the rules of the FDIC or the NCUA or Visa and MasterCard, depending on where they're playing. And it raises costs for everybody in the whole value chain because of that. So um, what one of the things that I want to switch gears on you just a little bit and and I don't, you may not have a perspective on this and if you don't, that's fine. Just tell me. But one of the things that we're dealing with a lot in talking to customers, and this is really cuts across the spectrum. It doesn't matter if you're regulated or not is, you know, the prevalence and the concern around cybersecurity. And was just curious, what are you hearing from these? I mean, <laughs> if you're a higher risk business and you've got sort of existential issues around whether you can get paid or not, maybe, maybe you don't have as many concerns about this kind of thing, but what's the talk like around sort of the cybersecurity issues as it relates to some of these higher risk businesses, is that impacting you guys at all? And is there anything happening in terms of on the compliance side? Are you seeing anything from a regulatory perspective where they're starting to think about this as a new dimension of risk that perhaps the regulators need to be interested in? I don't know if they do or not. I'm just curious. Um, yeah. So we don't deal a lot with kind of cybersecurity risk. Um, but I will say that. Um, with things like uh, crypto, right? Um, Taking a step back, fintechs have had to deal with ACH fraud at, at, in a, in a big way, right? Because the goal of fintech was to is to open up the service banking services to more people to everyone, and in doing that, they opened Pandora's box a little bit, and it was a heyday for a while for um, for scammers for for fraud. Um, with new innovation like real-time payments networks that just enables real-time fraud with cryptocurrency. Now you've got complexity layered on top of the existing systems where, you know, cryptocurrency has different challenges around cybersecurity, around recoverability, around, sure. you know, tra you know, tracking down the bad guys. Uh, and you're combining that with the potential for ACH fraud because it's you got to connect cryptocurrency to the old rails as well. Right. So you ACH in, do your crypto stuff, ACH out. Like there's st you're still dealing with the same old fraud plus brand new fraud. Um, so financial institutions are dipping a toe in the water with um, with cryptocurrency, and they're starting to act as um, as holders, and they're partnering with companies like Nidig. And what uh, NIDIG will help a financial institution do is to offer Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies to their account holders. And now you have the, the, the brand and the security and the feeling of safety that comes with a financial institution that you know, plus this new thing, right? And so I, I think that's an interesting space that, that I see growing pretty quickly, um, but it comes with uh, you know, this, this NIDIG company has to bring all of the kind of cybersecurity and intelligence around right. this technology because the financial institutions don't get it. Um, it's all Makes very sense. new to them. And so with cybersecurity, the, the tough part is not knowing what you don't know. And with emerging markets, one of the reasons they're considered high risk is because the regulators oftentimes don't know the rules around hemp, cannabis, crypto, the financial institutions and those responsible for following the rules don't always know the rules. Right. Um, and same with cybersecurity. Um, these financial institutions have worked really, really hard to lock down what they have today. Yeah. And now they're banking these new markets where there's unknown risk. Um, and so there's, um, there's a big challenge there. Makes sense. It makes sense. Um, is there any talk around or, or, or requirements or expectations that um, that banks and credit unions have of of the customers they're banking that they have cybersecurity insurance? Are they concerned about that at all? Um, no, it's not one of the things that they check. They're more concerned about understanding the pedigree of the person and the pedigree of the business. <clears throat> there are some kind of new risks 
in this as well, right? Like if your um, if your hemp or slash CBD product is higher than 0.03% THC, it's illegal, right? It it becomes THC cannabis, and Different. you know yeah. now you yeah now you need to be in a certain state for that to be legal. So now there's a risk that your crop gets too much sun and the THC levels rise. And now it's an illegal crop and you got to burn the thing. Right. So now there's going to be new insurance products around crop insurance specifically for that. I see. Okay. Yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. It's insurable risk. Right. Yeah. You've got, you know, um, you've got uh, security risks, right? We were talking earlier about this, the, um, the non-virtuous cycle of cutting THC businesses off from the debit and credit networks is now they have to operate in cash. And that cash is heavy, obvious, expensive to deal with, um, and increases the likelihood that, that you or your employees might get robbed. So now there's there's a risk. But now now it's a high risk business. Now it's a high Even risk so. business all of a sudden, <laughs> yeah, because you're dealing with cash, and it opens the doors for money laundering, for theft, uh, and for 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 people getting injured. Yeah. Um, yeah. These are really valuable products. Um, you know, ensuring your inventory. You know, so. Um, I think the, uh, I see it as a bunch of new opportunities for businesses, right. For folks to create new products for this market. Um, but at the core, they are problems that need to be solved. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I guess kind of a, a little bit different angle, you know, I'm trying to bounce back and forth from a couple of different things, but thinking about, again, take coming back and thinking about risk out as a startup company, forget about what you're doing or who you're serving. But as you try to grow, um, and, and build that business, what technology challenges are you guys running into? Um, again, forget about the regulatory stuff for a second, just as you try to grow the business, what, where are you guys experiencing, you know, what are the challenges that, that technology, and in this case, technology, meaning more sort of traditional, you know, it could be your, your baseline technologies or it could be, um, you know, people, systems, software, etc. Did you just mansplain technology to me, Brian? Well, I did. I did. <laughs> it's kind of fun too, because I know you're way more technical than I am. <laughs> so you I mean, you know what we dealt with in in the banking space, right? Web internet is beautiful. Everything talks to each other. There's the APIs, RESTful APIs, you've got standardized languages, you've got standardized databases. Everything works together. In banking, that's not the case, right? In payments, that's not the case. It's very difficult to get information to flow through a system, unlike in web software, right? Or, or with web technology. Old cores, debit and credit rails, ACH rails. I mean, this is all... I mean, legacy technology, stuff that's been, you know, unfortunately, businesses that got into technology early actually have bigger challenges, right? If you waited until now to get started and you just started an industry from scratch, my assumption is that the CBD industry, as far as the technology is probably not going to become very problematic. Yeah. But they don't have access to the, to the best stuff, right. From the best providers, none of their systems talk together very well. Um, it's very difficult to get information about your books from one place to another. It's, you know, so it's, all of these integration problems that get solved when you have standardized systems that um, that instead financial institutions and these businesses are having to cobble together. And that's not their strong suit, right? Uh, you, I'm sure you see this a lot. The business is good at what their business is, not IT. Um, and so that's um, that's a problem that's exacerbated you know, uh, by regulation, yeah. but it's a, it's a separate technology problem. And so I see, I see um, the value that we can provide as helping to be a, a connective tissue, right? Um, but the most, um, most kind of urgent need is understanding, is this business one who they say that they are, and are they a good one to work with? And this goes beyond, you know, just banking, right? Everyone kind of wants to understand what is the pedigree of this business, particularly in a Wild West environment, right? You've got a gold rush going on here. You have a lot of sketchy players moving into the space who don't care about risk. Um, you've got fintechs and, and other technology providers whose primary objective, 
right, is to make a make a good technology product, get people to use it. And then like third, fourth or fifth is compliance and risk, right, right. at the end of that chain. Same with a lot of the startups in, in cannabis and hemp, right, both growers, manufacturers and retailers. So over time, you will get more mature players in the space um, and you'll start to see more innovation and you'll start to see more complete solutions to the problem. And I think that there's a lot of money in solving the complete problem of what is the pedigree of this business? Are they following all the rules? Are they known to us? Do they have good you know, credit standing with other financial institutions? Are they not on any watch lists? Are they not part of the cartel? You know, like these kinds of questions that you have to answer um, for these businesses, it's, it's an expensive uh, amount of research to do ev for every single business. Yeah. Yeah. Which explains to your point why banks and credit unions just opt out, right? It's not, I mean, they've got, they've got options. It's not like, I mean, not that every bank is just growing like mad, but there are plenty of segments that they're not serving yet. And so they're looking at this alongside other potential segments or growing in segments perhaps where they have some presence, but haven't grown, you know, they they feel like they've got more opportunity. So I think, I guess they're setting that next to, you know, you used grocery stores, you know, maybe you're in a place where there's lots of grocery stores that are opportunities, but you only have a few. Do you want to continue to try to get more grocery stores or do you want to try to learn and figure out how to, you know, serve uh, hemp growers? It's easy to see how the answer would be the the startup effort, you know, the, the sunk cost on that is too big. It's not worth it at this point, maybe later. And if everybody says maybe later, there's no lenders, right? I mean, I mean right. And, and let me give you an example with licensing. So, so outside of just the banking information problem, um, there's no central licensing for cannabis or hemp, right? Um, hemp recently, um, uh, through the help of the FDA, um, created a, a central way to, um, to, to apply for licenses, but the system is taking forever to go live. So if I want to understand who has a hemp license, that's very difficult for me to do. For THC, it's state by state. Some states don't share it at all. You can't get a list of who has a THC license, which is crazy. It seems like the reason you'd have it. Yeah, you have to do a FOIA request to get it. Some, you know, have a database. So you can go look it up. But that simple thing, how do I know if this guy's licensed to be doing what he's doing is, is very difficult to do right, right now. You got to pay someone to go get that information for you. So um, until this industry evolves to a place where it's as easy as ver verifying their driver's license, you know, licensing is going to, you know, understanding their licensing is going to be an expensive proposition. Right. right. Makes sense. All right. Well, we've been going for a while um, and I know you got to get back to it uh, and I do too. So I figured uh, why don't we let's do, a, I like to generally kind of wrap up with a couple of kind of personal things just to, just to close it out. Yeah. It's uh, I didn't tell you about this. So yeah, I figured you'd be ready though. Um, again, I know uh, you've been busy lately. We've talked some, but anything that you've read or watched lately that you, that struck you that you think would be something you'd want to recommend to other people to check out? Oh man. Um, I watched the Tony Hawk documentary till the wheels come off and, and it wasn't, it wasn't what I expected. So I grew up loving Tony Hawk. I was never a skateboarder. I was not cool. Um, but I did play all of the pro skater games, right? right. Um, way less bruises and concussions. Yeah. What, what struck me about it is that Tony Hawk's dad got really into it. He, he organized all of the competitions that he and all of the other skateboarders competed in. And his friends gave him shit because his dad was, you know, he was the boss and they thought he was cheating or helping him out. But all he was doing was organizing these events and skateboarding wouldn't be, wouldn't have become what it, became when it did without that right so obviously tony hawk had great skill and was crazy risky willing to figure out how to do stuff but without his dad as sort of an adult organizing things that kind of created the opportunity for him to shine it sounds like doing doing that boring stuff of you know organizing and getting judges and buying the trophy and 
you know, figuring out pointing system. I mean, like all of that boring infrastructure stuff. Um, I, I love that. And uh, um, kind of it, it makes me think about, you know, how you set the stage for for greatness. Right. Right. Um, when we think about what we want to build, what we want to be remembered for. You know, it's easy to like, I want to be Michael Jordan. Like, well, how about the guy that, you know, invented the shoes that helped Michael, you know, or, or the guy that organized the meat so that Tony Hawk could become right. Tony Hawk. Unsung heroes are always, you, you can't get there without them, but they're called unsung heroes for a reason. Right. Yeah. Anyway, I thought, I thought that was really cool. Excellent. All right. Last question. What's the first piece of technology or technology memory that you have as you look back to your early childhood? What's something that you can really that sort of stands out as your first real technology memory, and it can't be television. Um, I mean, so the <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna go real dork on you, right? So this is in an era where, um, you know, you could com- connect your TI eighty three calculators and then like move code back and forth like just seeing that blew my mind and and at that point um i started getting into uh building my own computer like putting in a sound sound blaster sound cards uh putting in video cards all for like the purpose of gaming and so I, i think it's really easy to 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 crap on gaming you know as a as a parent but when I think about it, like that's what got me into tech. That's what made me understand how my computer worked. That's what made me understand how software worked. Um, and so, you know, I think um, taking taking that case off the computer, plugging all of the pieces in, seeing how all the wires connect. Um, I, I remember that just like feeding curiosity. And I think the the one thing that sustained me through my career is I, I'm trying to follow my curiosity. And I feel very lucky right now to be in a in a role where I get to follow my curiosity kind of wherever it goes. And it kind of started with breaking my dad's computer at home. <laughs> oh, that's perfect. I think given where we started and what you're doing now and the industries you're working with, that's a great place to end. So Carlos, I really appreciate you taking the time for being on Cut the Shit. Thanks, Brian. Take care of yourself. Later. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you are enjoying the podcast, we'd appreciate it if you would become a subscriber wherever you get your podcasts. And if you could rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, that would really help us out. Or you can just go old school and tell your friends, your family, your colleagues, and hell, anybody else who you think might want to hear something like this to listen in. If you're on social media, make sure to follow us on Twitter, Our handle is at cuttheshit underscore pod. We are also on TikTok, at cuttheshitpod, all one word, where we post lots of clips from the podcast. And last but not least, you can also watch the YouTube version of the show on our YouTube channel, at Plow Networks. Until next time, take care and have a great day.